Hello, I'm uh, Scaffi Elias. Um, I uh, work at a company called Three Donkeys with uh, Richard Garfield. Uh, you've probably heard of him and not me. Uh, and um, I worked at Wizards of the Coast for a long time, for many, many years. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started this uh, consulting business and um, uh, just sort of go around and help people with uh, their games. Um, I was supposed to ask everyone to silence their cell phones. Uh, thanks. And... Um, yeah, the one piece of advice the assistant gave me was to not choke. So I will attempt to not do that. Um, uh, as recently as 24 hours ago, I thought this was a 60-minute talk due primarily to a lack of intelligence. And uh, so uh, good luck as the audience. Um, you're going to have to do your best Calvin Johnson impersonations and catch what I am throwing. Uh, so luck and skill in games. The talk's primarily about um, how luck and skill interact. Uh, with each other. And why do we care? We care because uh, a lot of times you'll hear complaints, there's too much luck in a game, it's, there's too much skill in a game, and uh, it matters a lot to your audience, and it matters more and more to your audience as time goes on, uh, the longer they associate themselves with your game. Um, virtually every definition of game that you'll find uh, will state that some amount of indeterminacy is required. And those definitions that don't state it uh, explicitly uh, imply it. Uh, it is a necessary part of what it means to be a game. And um, what creates uh, indeterminacy, well, randomness does. So we get to luck and skill, and we try to um, start defining these. And we find that, first of all, they're very difficult to define. Uh, it's not, colloquially, we have uh, some understanding of these. When we try to nail down very strict definitions, it can often turn out uh, that they lead to counterintuitive results. Um, and I think that's uh, exactly how to define it. We're not going to be uh, too careful with, but what, uh, how they interact with each other is, is sort of what we'll be talking about. Um, so over at Randomness in Games, this is actually easy to see. It's easy to define. It happens a lot. Um, you can have dice, cards, random number generators, and that's clearly going to add a degree of randomness to your game. Um, some things that may be less clear are uh, game theoretic randomness that comes from, say, simultaneous decisions, um, uh, other players, politics, um, there's a lot of other ways besides sort of overt randomness. Uh, and then, of course, there's physical and mental limitations. Um, your memory, uh, your accuracy, throwing darts at a dartboard, uh, that's clearly random. Um, again, it's not completely random, uh, but for all practical purposes, it's random within a certain um, set of parameters. Uh, your speed your strength, these are the sorts of things that uh, create randomness in games. Uh, a simple way to have randomness in a game is maybe, maybe you have a simple choice between two doors. Door A leads to victory and door B leads to success. Uh, and, or sorry, <laughs> failure. Um, and, uh, and so it's pretty clear, right? Uh, the ogre's behind one door and the treasure's behind the other. Um, it's completely random. But what if, uh, you had some information about the doors that maybe you don't even see at first. Maybe there's a very complex way that you could have figured out uh, what was behind uh, one door uh, and what was behind the other. And this choice that was random to you, if you decide that you can't figure out these equations, uh, is it really random? Is it really randomness in the game or is it a matter of skill? So oftentimes uh, when you ask people uh, to name a game that has uh, no luck in it, uh, chess is the first thing that pops up. And uh, because there's no overt elements, there's no hidden decisions. Um, and so uh, it seems, it feels like this should be a game where it was a game of pure skill. Uh, my, uh, my business partner, Richard, uh, has often said, oh, maybe one day he'll play Gary Kasparov at chess and um, to sort of prove that there's randomness in chess, he'll just play randomly and win. Uh, and it's clear that he can do this. Uh, uh, Gary Kasparov has not won every chess game he's ever played. And uh, as long as there is some set of moves uh, that uh, will lead to victory against him, uh, Richard could stumble upon it. Uh, unfortunately, 
his chances are better of winning the New York State Lottery uh, 15 times in a row. So he shouldn't go uh, betting a lot of money uh, on playing against Gary. But the point is that um, there is randomness in this game. Unless, of course, Gary has the entire move tree memorized in his head, and he has a response regardless of what that random move is. It feels for a game like chess that it should be pure skill. And sometimes we forget that uh, while chess is quantitatively different than tic-tac-toe, it's not qualitatively different. And tic-tac-toe is a game where you can observe people playing, and it's very similar to the situation of the concealed doors, where you and I may not experience randomness when we play it, but children do. And uh, it's very interesting. There's, um, there's been some... Uh, reports done on this of watching children play. And you can find that the results are uh, mapped very similarly in character to, uh, to the results of chess players playing against each other, where you'll have a set of people where it's virtually purely random. Some people are better. They're able to see a little bit in the decision tree, so they're making less mistakes. And then some people have the game uh, essentially solved. Um, we're probably too far behind that, but the uh, past our memory of tic-tac-toe to remember when it seemed random, when it seemed difficult. And we had to make a guess when we didn't for sure know what the next best move was. Um, so the point to this is that uh, the amount of luck in a game is not a function of the game itself. Uh, it's a function of the game and the player. And that's something that's uh, very important to understand. Let's take another pure skill game like chess. Um, it's not the most fun game, but uh, it's still a game. And it's, you've got 30 seconds to compute the 50,347,200th digit of pi. Uh, does anyone want to play? Um, and you take a guess. It's obvious to us, it may not be so obvious if we look at a game like chess, that it is, that there is randomness in it. Um, but it is obvious that in this game there is randomness in it uh, because this is impossible to compute in the amount of time. However, again, without changing the character of the game, we can say, uh, what's the fourth digit of pi? And now when we're playing this game, this is inside the scope of the human mind and uh, with a little simple memorization, now all of a sudden this game that was purely random has no more randomness associated with it. The point about this game is that it's not just about the game and not just about the players, but it actually changes over time. Even if you sort of understood the complexity of the human brain to a much higher degree than we'll ever understand, and even if you understood exactly the calculations required to, uh, to play the, the previous game, um, if when you play the fourth digit of pi game in 2000 BC, it's purely random. It's no different than when those people are guessing the 50 millionth digit of pi. And when you play it around 250 BC, it all of a sudden becomes an incredibly skill testing game. Uh, Archimedes around this time starts figuring out within uh, his guess would be between three different digits. Uh, and, uh, and now in 2080 or 2013, uh, there's again no. Uh, randomness left in the game, or, and there's uh, a very little bit of skill, uh, but there is some. And the interesting thing here is that you can't determine by looking at the game, or even the, play, the capabilities of the players, you can't determine how much randomness there is in the game. It's something that varies over time. So we think we have an idea of what these pure luck things mean in a game, but what does it mean to have skill at a game? Well, the dictionary definitions <clears throat> of skill are the ability to do something well. Uh, another way to say it is it's an intrinsic ability to achieve a differential outcome in a game. Um, and note that all of these things with the word well or um, trying to achieve one outcome over another uh, hinge on the fact that skill is essentially a comparison. And so the measurements of skill that we have, like an ELO rating system or whatever, are always uh, comparisons. Um, that's the best way to get at what it means to have skill in a game. Uh, when you ask people, uh, is this game more skill testing than another game? Does game A have more skill than game B? How do we measure that? 
is there a simple way that we can do that? Well, um, when you ask, say, students in a class or uh, have sit around and have a discussion about it, some of the things that pop up are, what's your maximum win percentage? Um, there's, an, there's an intuitive thought for people that uh, if a game is very skill-testing, the best player, a pro at that, should essentially always beat the worst player at the game. It's pretty clear if the best player in the world has a 50% win chance against the worst player in the world, let's say the game is cutting for high card, um, there's no skill in the game. So, uh, and the higher that number goes, um, in some sense, there is more skill in the game. Uh, another common way of defining how much skill there is in the game, and this is actually a very interesting and effective one because it leads to... Um, say, social structures that, or, that might develop around the game or the metagame of the game, is um, how many different buckets uh, can you put people into where bucket two has a 75% chance of beating the bucket from people one? How long is that chain? Um, the longer that is, uh, I think almost everybody would say there's more skill in that game. Uh, the ELO rating, which I think uh, probably most people are familiar with, it's the chess rating system. Lots of video games use it. Uh, it's been altered over time. Um, actually, can reconstruct, uh, if the assumptions that ELO made are true, can reconstruct that uh, level of uh, the chains of skill. Um, and what it does is it sort of assumes a random performance on people's part. And uh, actually is pretty good at modeling a lot of different games. But the complete set of information is actually a much, much, much more complicated thing. Uh, it's, if you really want to know how much skill there is a game, you would need to know the true expected win percentage of every single player versus every other player over time. This is not something you're going to be able to get. This is virtually impossible. And how the curves of player performance change um, is actually very interesting because it is not easy to uh, a simple linear parameterization of the level of skill of people. Um, so you have to choose what you're going to measure because you're only going to be able to take a slice and you have to choose wisely. Let's take, for example, uh, this game we'll call Rando Chess. Uh, we like to use sample games because sometimes it actually gets to the heart of the matter more than, say, uh, a real game does. Um, so you play a normal game of chess, and then afterward you roll a die. Uh, and then on a one, whoever lost the game, they are declared the winner. Um, well, Rando Chess clearly has more luck than chess does. But does it have less skill? Well, when you think about it, uh, any sort of of these reasonable definitions of skill that you had beforehand in your intuition are that really, actually, it doesn't have any less skill. And what do I mean by that? All of your previous skills are still useful. Your player ranking of every single player in the world has not changed at all. You still have the same world championship. You, same, cha same world champion. You still have all of the chess books. You still have all the opening moves. You still have every little bit of effort and every little bit of skill that you would want to acquire to win chess. That's all still existing in the game of rando chess. And the point to that is that the skill versus luck is actually a false dichotomy. Really, you should think of it more as a graph where you have a certain amount of skill in games and a certain amount of luck in games. And games can be uh, sort of placed anywhere uh, on that. Um, Go has, uh, Go has uh, a lot of skill, as does poker. But poker has more luck. So what did change in Rando Chess? The game clearly changed. Skill, by a reasonable definition of it, didn't change. Uh, but what did change was, as luck went up, skill became harder to measure. In order to achieve that same ranking, um, you would actually need more trials than before. Another way to say that your skills is harder to measure is that you get less payoff in terms of your victories for the same amount of skill. Um, so when you add luck to a game, and you make skill harder to measure, what's happened? Is that bad? It may very well be bad, because um, maybe your players expect a very high payoff for the amount of skill that they've acquired at the game. They have, have after all, put a lot of effort into it. Um, and 
key to understanding this is, key, is understanding what the value proposition of your game is for your players. Uh, for instance, if you're playing a competitive game and there's some payoff or skill, as those players continue to play that game or that genre of games over time, and they put more and more time and effort into mastering that game, they may very well expect a higher and higher payoff for their skill. And, uh, and that's how you get things like fighting games becoming more and more skill testing over time. If you're a dedicated customer of these sorts of things, again, for a competitive game, where inherently in the setup it's you versus the other person on an emotional level as well as uh, sort of a rules level, um, it's not unlikely that you're going to uh, be very upset when your payoff for skill uh, gets lowered. So should we remove all, all indeterminacy from games? Uh, when you do that, uh, you can run into trouble if you make a gear game to skill testing. You can play the game who's taller. Uh, and then when you do that, it's no longer a game because you've removed the indeterminacy. Really, it's more of a measurement. And measurements are fun to play at most once. When you look at games on our luck versus skill graph, you can see things like a foot race. There's really not that much randomness in a foot race. Uh, people's times do vary, but they vary by a relatively small amount. And that's why, back to the measurement thing, how many times is it fun to take a measurement, you'll see grade children, grade school children, will play foot race. And they'll play it once or maybe twice. And there's not a lot of people in high school or post-college or elderly people playing the game foot race. And there's a strong reason for that. And that's because it's not that fun to play time after time after time. Whereas you can have games that have more skill associated with them. And again, by more skill, you can, you can take a sort of a empirical measurement of the amount of training that people do to become world-class sprinters as compared to world-class soccer players uh, and see that it's less uh, in order to achieve the top of the profession. And, uh, but there's a lot more luck in these sorts of things. And you can look at this chart and say, oh, I kind of understand intuitively that um, I may not want to reduce my uh, indeterminacy by too much. I don't want to skip over this too quickly, but there are other benefits of luck and randomness in games um, that we are not talking about. Uh, there's a million benefits to randomness in games. Um, for instance, people are just enthralled by unexpected outcomes. Uh, specifically, though, since we're talking about the luck and skill interaction, uh, we're gonna, that, that, that's a subject for another talk. So when you add luck to a game, because you've looked at this chart and, uh, and you see, oh, well, look, golf's sitting there. Uh, a lot of people play golf uh, more than play foot race. Um, and uh, what are some of the benefits of adding luck to a game? Well, one of the benefits is that when you play a game that has luck in it, uh, we saw this a lot uh, with Magic, uh, the gathering. Um, people would tend to blame their successes on skill, and uh, they would blame their defeats on luck. That's great. That's an amazing psychological crutch for your players. It makes people much happier playing the game, even though uh, they're losing. Um, because there is an overt randomness to it, it gives them something to uh, very clearly fall back on. Uh, the problem is, over time, you sort of, the, the more and more experienced players are, the less and less this illusion will hold up and they understand that it really is their fault. But your, the great benefit of this is, is that early on in a player's career, they may uh, get an ego boost when they're first starting to play the game. Uh, another benefit of adding luck to the game is um, the amount of people that you can have fun with, uh, that is to say, play an indeterminate game, goes up. In a game with really low luck, uh, you can have most games be too hard. Uh, or too easy, and they're not fun to play. Again, it's closer to a measurement. Um, it's a very difficult problem to solve today with the internet and computers and matching systems. You can find that just right person if your audience is big enough. Um, and the problem is that even after you find that exact right person who you're going to have a fun game against, 
they're, you might find the right person in terms of skill, but are they the right person? Are they the friend that you want to play with? Maybe you want to play with your family. You want to sit around in a living room. So this ability of matching in the Internet and computers to solve this problem doesn't help. If I want to play with Timmy and my game is so skill testing that uh, it's not fun to play, then I have to think that maybe I'm playing the wrong game. As we mentioned before with the fighting games, um, payoff for skill is something that players, uh, especially in games where reward for skill is extremely important, say poker, um, uh, over time they may expect to get a higher and higher payoff. But because luck can broaden audiences, Phil is probably not so upset that uh, poker has less payoff for the skill that he's put into it. He would much rather be uh, the prince of the set of all poker players, uh, top 10 or 20, than he would be the undisputed number one of an audience the size of, say, Go players. So the situation is a lot more complex than you can see from something like the ELO system because um, a one-dimensional parameterization of the amount of skill that people have doesn't necessarily uh, really tell you what's going on. Um, however, and, and you can actually see that. There's some sample things here you can see. For instance, uh, there might be an element of luck in the game that's only accessed if you have high skill. Maybe you, when you go really, really far into the game, you're an amazing, amazing player, then you're able to access this bonus level. Once you hit that bonus level, there's a random, you know, 99% of your score gets access to that bonus level. What that sort of thing will do is if you add that to your game, you have reduced you've increased the luck between top players playing against each other and you haven't changed it at all for your lower level players and you haven't changed it at all for when your higher level players play against your low, 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 lower level players. The same sort of thing can also happen because um, some elements of randomness can only be uh, accessed by playing poorly, like maybe a shell in Mario Kart or something like that. So how your skill curve of each person and how they interact with each other and how much skill there is and how much randomness there is in their interactions uh, is actually a very com complicated situation. We'll take this example. Um, maybe you have a real-time strategy game and uh, you can have randomized prices or technologies in it. Um, before randomization, maybe it's very clear what the best strategy is. The best strategy is to build a tank. And you have three different players, and uh, their ratings are, you know, you have two excellent players. And the game is primarily based upon, say, hand-eye coordination, tactical skill, that sort of thing. Your strategic choices aren't really that important. But then you play, and the prices have become randomized between all these objects. So all of a sudden, uh, maybe dragons are a viable strategy now. Um, they were overpriced before, but now that's the way to go. Well, you've clearly added skill to the game. For the player to decide in the beginning what the proper choice is, is an area of skill and mastery. Um, so maybe player A can now beat player B more often. That 100-point rating differential between them might expand. The levels in your skill chain might actually go up. At the same time, uh, maybe the best skilled player in the world can only uh, pick the right thing 90% of the time. And player C picks the right thing 10% of the time. Well, if the strategic choices outweigh all of the hand-eye coordination and all of the tactical skill that you could develop at that game, guess what? The, the wind differential, the expected wind differential between player A and player C will now go down, even though it went up with player A versus player B. So how do you use all this information? Since basically what you sort of, the more you look at it, the more you realize how complicated the situation is. Well, I would start by saying you have to know, what your, you have to know who your audience is. You have to know what your intended audience is. Uh, and what's your key value proposition to them? Do they expect that it's a highly competitive game? Do they expect a high reward payoff for their skill? Is it going to be played around the family uh, dinner table? I mean, if it is, uh, you better make sure that you can have a, a, 
highly indeterminate game among almost any set of people that are there. Uh, is it going to be played over the internet? Is it going to be played solo? All of these things will tell you how much randomness you ideally would have in your game in order to get a significantly consistent amount of indeterminacy uh, in each instance of that game. Um, does your revenue model require replays? This is a really important consideration. Again, back to the foot race example. Uh, if your revenue model says, I want this person to come back and play again and again and again and again, you want to stay as far away from that measurement as possible unless perhaps you have a truly enormous audience. So you know that you can always match that person up perfectly against someone who's almost at exactly their skill level. It's a very hard thing to do, but it is possible. Another important consideration is do your IP and marketing match your skill and luck interaction? Mario and the dragon from RTS sample game number seven uh, are not the sorts of things which appeal to the type of players that are going to want to play a game like Go, which has an extremely, extremely, extremely long skill chain, very high reward uh, ratio for the skill that you achieve at the game, and it's extremely competitive. And sorry that the talk was so short. I had to skip over some things. Um, uh, Richard and Robert and I uh, wrote a book, Characteristics of Games. A lot of this stuff's in there if you want to read more about it. Any questions?